All right, welcome everybody to the live stream. As you can tell, it's just me today. Uh, Dan is not here. Um, so my name is Kyle Seagraves. Uh, I'm a loan officer licensed in all 50 states, and I'm gonna answer your questions about how to buy a house. So uh, just leave those in the comments and I'll put them up on screen here. Um, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you have about buying a house or getting a mortgage. Um, let's see who we have in here right now. Uh, Star, welcome. Um, who else? Tilla, Tillamook Mini Homesteader. Um, D. Nolan, August Frost, Cassandra, uh, good to see you. You're just here for the shenanigans, Cassandra. Sweet. <laughs> Let me see what shenanigans I can cook up here. Um, and we'll see. And, uh, yeah, so we can cover, um, kind of what's happened with like realtor commissions and I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to sit back just a little bit, take it a little casual. What's, what's up with everyone? What are we doing? What do we, what do we got going on tonight? A nice rowdy little Wednesday at 6.20 on Eastern time. Let me see if there's a way to make me zoom in here a little bit. Um, you know something I have found recently that doesn't relate to buying a house is uh, air cooker, air fryers. Apparently I've been sleeping on those. Um, those are a great time. I just got one and I've been using it so much. Let's see, can I zoom into me? There we go. That's better. All right, sweet. Let me pull up the comments here. Oh my God, where'd they go? All right. So yeah, I want to cover also what happened with like realtor commissions. Um, there was a big ruling on that, that we don't know how that's going to shake out yet. Quite, uh, quite yet. Um, but I do want to cover that in here. Uh, Euphoria3.com. Hello. Hello. All right. Let me get to some questions here. Um, D Nolan says, I love my air fryer. See, what do you, what are you making in it? I feel like I'm just doing the basic, like, chicken and vegetables thing. And I feel like I need to branch out a little bit. Um, star, you said, can you explain the process of buying a home as a caregiver for an elderly parent, a YouTuber? So there's a loan available with only 5% down. Um, now star, you know, you're not allowed to watch other YouTubers. Come on, come on. Um, no, yeah, that's absolutely true. So let me pull up Fannie Mae guidelines here. So there's different ways that you can occupy a primary residence. Well, I guess I got to move up now. Um, there's different ways you can occupy a primary residence. So one of those ways, let me zoom in so it's a little bit easier to read here. So one of those is a parent or a legal guardian wanting to provide housing for their handicapped or disabled child. Um, and another is children wanting to provide housing for parents. So in your situation, it just says if the parent is unable to work or does not have sufficient income to qualify for a mortgage on their own, the child is considered an owner occupant. So this is where you would be able to buy a home on their behalf. So you still have to qualify for the mortgage in your name, but then you do only have to put 5% down. Um, so, you know, the other alternative would be where people would buy a home as like an investment property where you would need to put 15 to 20% down for that. Um, and so this is a really great occupancy type for a lot of people um, who are wanting to help in that way. Um, so really, really great question. Um, and Star, I don't want to hear about you watching other other YouTubers. Don't don't let me hear about that. Um, oh man, I should have set up all these settings before I started, and you know I didn't, and this is what I get. Uh, okay. Uh, Tillamook Mini Homesteader said, uh, thanks buddy for being such a great resource. You answered my questions during a home purchase back in May of 2021, uh, and we're still loving the house we won. Awesome. Well, I'm glad, uh, I'm glad to help and thank you for letting me know. I'm curious, uh, what is your interest rate? Um, what interest rate did you get? Because 2021, let's see, May of 2021, I'm trying to remember exactly where interest rates were at that time. Um, thanks star. I appreciate it. <laughs> Uh, D Nolan said, what's the monthly payment on a $450,000 home and a 705, uh, FICO. Um, let me pull that up for you. I open up this calculator here, switch it over. Um, so I have the calculator called, uh, the max purchase price calculator, and, um, you can use the code home, uh, for 20% off if you want to, to purchase this, um, or the code Kyle, either one works. And why does your comment disappear when I switch the screen? That's pretty frustrating. Let me pull this up here. Um, okay, so what you can do in here is, uh, you know, you can look at a $450,000 home and it's gonna help you compare different loan scenarios side by side. 
So for instance, uh, let's just use some estimates here, you know, in the state of Ohio. Um, I don't see where you're at uh, location wise. We'll just use some general estimates here. Um, let's say we're looking at a conventional loan with a 3% down payment. Um, and the interest rate right now is hovering around, if we go to, to our rates section here, hovering around 777, look at all those magic sevens. Um, so if we bring this in here, let's do 7.7. Um, a 705 FICO is probably going to put you in that around that range. Um, and we take a look. Let's add in for fun an FHA loan and see what that would look like around a 7.4. Let's do that. Okay. So what this calculator does is it helps you see which loan option is going to be the cheapest um, based on a breakdown of all the mortgage insurance costs, both upfront and monthly and then uh, any, any lender costs as well, along with interest. And so you can see where uh, conventional is the cheapest until year six, and then FHA becomes a cheaper option, which um, a lot of people just aren't familiar with. They think FHA is always more expensive. Um, and then as far as the monthly payment, we can see in year one, uh, the conventional loan is about $94 per month more expensive, so about $4,100, and the FHA loan is about 4000 and then as time goes on, we can see those payments change slightly. Uh, around year 13, conventional loan loses its mortgage insurance, which makes the FHA loan slightly more expensive per month because FHA mortgage insurance doesn't disappear, right? We can see it's still here in the red. Um, so hopefully that helps uh, clarify that real quick. Oh, you're in Texas. Uh, sorry. Um, but uh, you can also do the same thing in Texas. And that's, that's not a helpful screen, is it, to have that random ghost thing next to me um sweet raise adventures the real deal frank uh good to see you as well let me get to you let me fly through some more of these questions and i'll i'll jump back down to your guys in a second um august frost oh my goodness what is going on um are there any major differences with applying getting a loan for a condo instead of a normal single family house um are lenders more or less strict when it comes to non-single family homes um, yeah, so some of the, the bigger differences with condos is you're normally going to see a slightly higher interest rate. Um, and then also the condo needs to be, um, it, it depends what type of loan you're using. If you're using a conventional loan, um, most lenders want to see a warrantable condo, um, which really just means that, um, I'm trying to think of the, the way to make it the, the easiest to, to understand. Basically, they want to make sure that the condo association itself is well taken care of and has finances. Um, to make sure that you don't go underwater uh, in that condo association um, or if they're mismanaging funds or maybe they don't have adequate insurance or they've had they have active litigation against them things like that there are loans for non-warrantable condos but those usually require a uh, higher down payment percentage and then also if you're looking at an fha loan or a va loan then those condos need to be approved on a condo list um, and if they're not, you can do uh, spot unit approvals, which basically, um, you know, the lender will go through and check to see if the condo meets all the requirements for FHA and VA, um, which can take a little bit more time. So if that's the case, if a condo is not approved FHA and you want it to get approved FHA, um, it's something we can do, but I would just plan for a longer, maybe 45 to 60 days in your contract to close rather than kind of pushing it to just, you know, a standard 30. Um, Cassandra, thank you for being here with, for the shenanigans. Um, okay, let's see. Dot com said, hello, Kyle. If I buy a house with cash and house is, is due by cash. What? Wait, hold on. If I buy a house with cash and house is due by cash, do has house cash. Okay. I, this is a, this is a joke <laughs> for a second. I was like, I'm losing my mind right now. This is hard to say. If I buy a house with cash and house is due by cash, do house cash due by do cash house? That's pretty hard. You got me. <laughs> you got me. I can't. I can't read all these, uh, you know, quickly without throwing them up on screen. Um, oh gosh, maybe I should read some of these so I don't get. Uh, I don't say things I shouldn't. Um, you said, hello, when is it safe to get an arm? Can you set an interest rate limit and a float rate? Drew, I can always say Oregon correctly. I was just in Oregon, right? So, uh, well, maybe you don't know that. Um, I was just in Oregon. 
uh, Oregon. I still think I still think I say it right, right? Oregon. I think that's right. Um, when is it safe to get an arm? Let me pull up. Uh, I've been kind of working on a way to visualize arms, and this may help. Um, so arms have changed a lot over the past few years, and uh, let, let me kind of explain what's happening here in this little calculator. So arms first have a fixed period. So this is the time at which the interest rate doesn't change. This is like your introductory rate. So you might've heard like a five one arm. That means the first five years are fixed. So we can see from zero to year five or month 60 would be fixed. And maybe that's fixed at, let's say, um, let's say a 7.875% rate, just for an example. Now, the one in this is the adjustable period, right? So normally the adjustable period is going to be anywhere from six months to one year to five years. And the adjustable period means how often can the interest rate change after the fixed period? So in a five-year arm, you have five years where it's fixed at an interest rate. And then a 5-1 arm, every year after that, it can readjust to what the market is doing. Now, that means it can go up, but it can also go down or it can stay the same. When I think... When we talk about arms, I think we always need to look at the worst case scenario possible. And that's what I created with this like simple illustration here is what's the worst case scenario for this arm? I don't think it's fair to say, well, rates could go down. Sure, they could go down. Um, but if that's the case, you're probably looking at refinancing into a fixed rate loan to lock in a lower rate for as long as possible. So with arms, I think it's best to say, what's our worst case scenario here? Okay. Um, then arms also have a first change limit. So after the fixed period, there can be a change. Um, this is usually going to be one to 2% here, right? So you can see this change happens. So in this theoretical example, if we started at, let me just do just seven to make this a little bit easier to see. Um, because last, what was it? Like two weeks ago, uh, there was one particular lender that was offering, man, it was like an FHA 5-1 arm that started at, like six and a half percent. And so if that was the case, um, the first change limit was 1% and subsequent changes were one. Basically what happens is you would have that 6.5% rate for five years. And then all of a sudden the next year, that change could go as high as 7.5%. It um, doesn't mean it's guaranteed to go there, but that's the absolute maximum. And that's what I think we plan with arms is what's the worst case scenario. And so for a lot of people, an arm like that can make sense because basically what you're doing with an arm is you're kind of taking a little bit of a, a gamble of saying, well, I basically have six years where this arm is going to have a lower rate guaranteed than the fixed rate at the time. And so what you're doing with arms is you're basically saying or proposing the thought of, do I think interest rates will lower within the time frame that this is going to be lower than a fixed rate loan, right? Um, if so, then an arm could make sense. And then planning on refinancing into a long-term lower fixed rate loan. Um, but for a lot of people, you know, where arms are at right now because of where the economy is at, they're just not providing this kind of uh, discount up front. So arms really only make sense if you're getting like a nice discount up front, right? Obviously that arm can keep going higher and higher and higher until it reaches its maximum rate. But at the moment, uh, because we're kind of in this like really weird spot in the economy, um, short term investments like this, like you know, when people are purchasing these on the secondary market, um, are not uh, are actually like it's more risky for people to put money in long term. And so that's why we're not seeing arm rates being uh, much lower um, at the moment. So I hope that made sense. Um, arms can be a little bit a little bit tricky. Um, all that to say, uh, arms at the moment, I wouldn't suggest. I, I think most people don't need an arm right now. Uh, D Nolan said, I love my air fryer. Um, I know you said that you could put anything in it, but what do you, what else are you putting in it? I want to know, um, what, what you got going in there? Uh, make sure you get the liner so you don't have to clean up too much. Um, you know, I should probably do that instead of like using it three times before I clean it out. But I, I never said that. You didn't hear that. Uh, meatball steak and pizza. Hmm. I need more probably healthy things in my life. My diet already is probably not the, the best. 
Uh, yeah. Um, which is better, used or new house? Prices uh, are close to twenty to thirty thousand. Pros and cons. Um, I think with a lot of new homes, there's a lot of builders offering discounts that can be really, um, really smart to take advantage of. From from there, it really kind of comes down to preference on do you want a newer style of home or do you want an older home? Um, the only thing to be careful of, I, I feel like people get into the weeds on like assuming that every new build home is bad quality and somehow because a house is older that it's better quality. And that can be true, but it's not fair as a blanket statement because there are great new home builders and those are going to cost more money. Um, but there's also like older or used homes that are <laughs> really bad quality too. So I, I don't think it's fair to say like new homes are going to have lower quality than used homes, but I hear a lot of people just re like regurgitating that over and over again. Um, that's just not, that hasn't been true in my experience. So from there, I would just, I would more be interested in seeing what kind of incentives can you get from a builder with a new home? Because on the used side, you're not going to be seeing those incentives. Um, builders are really trying to move inventory. So that's what I would take a look at. Uh, Zachary said, I'm looking at buying a house in a different city or state uh, due to affordability. I plan on moving into an Airbnb for a couple months to look around first. Any tips or things I should uh, get started before? Um, yeah, first of all, I think it's a really good strategy to um, get acclimated to an area before you decide to move somewhere. So many people just like <laughs> go to a new city or they think they know a city and then they just buy a house. And what's been so interesting is like, um, you know, I, I live in Dayton, Ohio, and I've lived in this area uh, for most of my life. And it's been so interesting to see even like downtown all the different neighborhoods and the different pockets and how different those can be, even just in like terms of how steady or home prices, do home prices grow or, or decline, or they have they been static for years. Um, even seeing like business development locally and how that's impacting different neighborhoods is really interesting to see. And I rented for two years, I'm trying to think, yeah, it was, I think it was just about two years um, before I decided to purchase. And that was so helpful in getting acclimated to what neighborhoods I wanted to see. So I think that's a really smart plan. Um, I do have a video I just put out about a six month game plan for buying a house that you might be interested in where I cover pretty much everything you need to do to get prepared. Everything from credit to planning why you want to buy a house and writing that down, setting targets, uh, setting up savings and practice payments, um, and really making sure you have everything prepared and ready to go. That way, when you find the house that you love, you can actually um, move on it uh, uh, when you're ready. So, uh, Rock and Rosie said, nice Dayton, Ohio here too. Man, there's so many people who watch from Dayton, which is so strange to me um, because Dayton's not big. And like, I don't know if YouTube, I feel like YouTube doesn't like just push local stuff. I don't know. It's, it's weird, but it's cool to see that you're in Dayton as well. I'm sure I've, we've crossed paths at some point. Um, uh, Antonio said, if I buy a rehab home with 20% down, how would I be able to borrow for the rehab after closing? Um, first of all, it, I, I'm curious what kind of loan you're planning on using to purchase the home with. Um, if you're planning on rehabbing the home, I would just say, start with like a FHA two or K because you can do uh 3.5% down and then use the rest of that money as kind of a nice contingency reserve if you need it. Um, and you can always apply more money to the principal. Um, but it, I would start with a rehab loan. Um, otherwise, to try to get the money with an additional loan after the purchase uh, starts to become a little bit more complex because likely you won't be able to borrow against any equity you have in the home. So you'll need to refinance it anyway, which is just more costs. Um, or you're, oh, you're, oh, you're looking at conventional. Um, with conventional, you could also look at doing a home style um, I'm not as familiar with the home styles as I am with uh, two or three Ks, but um, that might be, I, I would look at trying to get the rehab loan first instead of doing two separate loans. Um, having it all in one thing is going to save you the most money on closing costs. Um, Omani, you said, what is your, and then nothing. <laughs> so I don't know what you're asking for. Uh, 
Tillamook. Is that, am I saying that right? Tillamook. Also, do you have like a YouTube channel? Uh, that's, you do like mini homesteading. Is that what that is? I'm gonna look it up. If you don't mind. Mini homesteader. Let's see what, what your channel is. You do, oh, okay. I don't, I don't think you post a ton of videos, do you? Oh wait, you got shorts. Sweet. Oh, and chickens. How many chickens do you have? Uh, my parents used to have some chickens and those things are so sassy. Why do those little, why do chickens have so much like personality? Uh, they're kind of, kind of wild. Um, Sargis, uh, do you have any experience closing loans for New York city co-ops? No, um, we don't really have anything for co-ops. Unfortunately, those are a whole different beast. Uh, the mook is pronounced like book, Tillamook, Tillamook. That sounds right. Um, okay. You said we got a 3.59 on an FHA, uh, which wasn't too impressive back then. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. And like, okay. So obviously, you know, hindsight's 2020 and, um, you know, it's, it's easy on this side to say like, see, I told you so, but I feel like myself and a lot of people, a lot of like real estate professionals at that time when rates were around that, you know, that bit, everyone, there were a lot of people who were not in the real estate world who were more like real estate influencers who were like, everything's crashing and don't buy right now because rates are high and home values are increasing. But then we were all like, no, it's probably going to continue to go this way for a while. And it has, and I know a lot of people have been priced out of the market because uh, they waited. Um, and again, nobody knows what the future could look like. It could have done the opposite thing and I could have been completely wrong, but um, I don't know. It's just, it's hard to communicate from information and data that you see without people feeling like you're just trying to slant some narrative on it. Um, so I don't know. What do I not know about cheese? What's happening here? I must have, uh... Oh, is Tillamook a cheat? Is that a cheese? <laughs> I don't know what that is. Um, let's see. Somebody else asked a follow-up question. I see the question about the visa. Where did that go? I will get to that. Um, I see your question here in the list, and I will, I will get to that here in just a second. Uh, it'll just take me a little bit to get down here. Um, raise adventures. How to use the Burr method uh, if you have to wait to get credit for the rental to be taken as income? Um, you know, I'm not familiar with the the B R R R <laughs> method. I, I'm very familiar with uh, like it in a general sense, but I don't know all the details. Um, so I, I wish I could help you with that, but I'm just I'm not super uh, knowledgeable on all the different like investing strategies and ways to do that. Um, get the likes up people. Well, th thanks. Thanks. The real deal. Um, Frank, uh, you said with the court ruling, I'm hearing buyers will be able to add the buyer's agent commission to the loan. Can you find out if that's happening or can that even happen? Man, to buy, add the buyer's commission amount to the loan. Uh, I am not aware of that being a possibility. If you, Frank, if you can send me whoever said, said that to you, um, and that might be good for me to just touch on really quickly and then I'll jump back into some questions here. So don't ask your question again. I will get to it. Um, let me pull this up. So for those of you who, who aren't familiar with what's happening and I, you don't have to be familiar with what's going on. You know, don't, don't ever feel like when you're looking at buying a house that you have to be up to date on every single thing that's happening. Um, the, the stress for buying a house is already high. You don't have to also, you know, know how to every single thing that's going on and become a real estate expert. You don't have to do that. So uh, basically what happened is there was a court case uh, and you can see there was a, a $1.8 billion uh, here in um, what's the correct legal term uh, settlement. Yeah, <laughs> I would say a settlement. Um, so the jury awards $1.8 billion in a realty case. So basically what's happening is, you know, if, if you're kind of new to buying a house, the, the standard is, uh, that the seller would pay around 6% of the purchase price 
um, to help pay for real real estate agents. So normally three, per, and this isn't the case everywhere, but just in general, normally it's 3% goes to the listing agent, the seller's agent, and then 3% goes to the buyer's agent. So when you buy a house, most people don't pay the buyer's agent. They don't pay their real estate agent to purchase a home because the seller pays for that. And that's kind of been the standard for years. Um, and the reason that's been a lot of the standard is because of what this uh, lawsuit was talking about and the decision that was made on this lawsuit. Um, where basically you have the National, National Association of Realtors, there was Remax in there, there was Keller Williams, Home Services of America. I think there were quite a few others that were also listed in there as well. Um, and basically they were saying, uh, it was interesting. We spent four and a half years uncovering the evidence of this conspiracy is, uh, is what they said. And, um, basically what's happening is they're, they're saying there's a version of, um, I don't know. I don't know law words enough to say, I don't want to say something that's like incorrect legally, <laughs> but basically, uh, or what they're saying is they're a conspiracy. There's a level of like collusion to, um, where sellers were effectively, uh, coerced in a way to pay that 6% so that their homes could be listed on the MLS. And the MLS is what real estate agents use, um, to be able to market homes and then new you know, buyers can find those homes. And so what they were saying, they had a really good quote in here. Um, if sellers do not agree to the commission terms, actually, let me go back here. Uh, that commission hovers around five to 6% of the sale price and is paid by the home seller to the seller's agent, and the buyer's agent. If sellers do not agree to the commission terms, they go virtually unseen in the market, uh, catch mark set. So the rule has stifled competition and has resulted in higher prices. Um, is what the plaintiffs alleged. They argued that if the rule were not in place, buyers would pay commission to their own agents, while buyers agents would have to compete by offering lower rates instead of the 3% assumed to be paid by the seller. And the lawsuit pointed to uh, countries whose total real estate commissions average one to 3%, such as United Kingdom, Singapore, Netherlands, Australia, and Belgium. Um, so at this point, I mean, this, this ruling was uh, yesterday. Right. So at the moment, I have no clue what's going to happen. Um, and Frank, to your comment about adding the buyer agent commission to the loan, I haven't heard of that. I'm not sure if that's, I don't even know in mortgage rules where that would be possible. Um, let me see if you had a follow up comment here. Yeah. I don't even know how that would be possible. And it's probably going to be a weird thing that the industry is going to have to deal with and figure out what this means, because does that mean, okay, they can't be forced to do that. Does that mean people are now getting like MLS access is going to have to be opened up? Um, is, would that, um, be sufficient for the ruling? Um, or like, I, I don't know what the implications of this are. Um, and I, I don't think I'm smart enough to fully speculate on what this means, but it's very possible that there's an option where buyers are going to have to in some way pay for their real estate agent or not use a real estate agent if they can't pay for it and i'm just not aware of any loan guideline that will allow, would allow you to just wrap that cost into a loan um it would have to be paid for up front uh so i don't know i'd be i'm really interested to see what happens there um the real deal said what's the absolute lowest percentage i can put down as a new home buyer um, zero, uh, percent. So there's a USDA loan that's zero percent down. Um, there's also VA loans at zero percent down. Uh, we have a conventional loan that's 1% down. Um, and if you do, if you want to get pre-qualified with us, you can schedule a call with our team, winthehouseyoulove.com. Um, with, uh, with all these low down payment options though, it's really important to remember there's still closing costs. Um, so closing costs are going to be things that not just the lender charges, but it's things like you have a home appraisal. Um, you also are going to have a home inspection. Um, you also have title fees. You have recording fees. Some states have transfer taxes, which can be several thousand dollars. Um, you also have an escrow account to prepay property taxes and homeowners insurance. So all these things can add up to be several thousand dollars. Now, the seller, you can negotiate for the seller to pay a portion of those closing costs. And in some instances, all of the closing costs, um, there are maximums to that. Um, which I am working on a calculator for, but I don't have finished yet. Um, so that is possible. You know, there are instances in which people have got USDA loans with really kind of 
and at the end, no money out of pocket. You know, maybe they had to pay for an appraisal up front, um, but the credits are enough that it covers that at the end. Um, I've done a couple USDA loans where people will get a check back at closing um, for tax probation, but it's not always the case. Um, when you ask for seller concessions for that much, it makes your offer way less competitive against other home buyers, um, which is tough in a real estate market like this. Um, also, not having money in your account when you apply for a mortgage makes it so much more difficult to get approved for a mortgage. Um, mortgage underwriting software likes you to have money. It does not like to see uh, when we put in how much money you have, putting in a zero <laughs> is uh, not a good way um, for that loan to get approved. So on top of that, outside of just what can you get approved for, I think it also it's really important to keep in mind that like you should not be buying a house if you don't have money. Um, and you shouldn't buy a house if buying the house is gonna drain your bank account because it's going to put you in a situation where you're going to have to go into debt if something happens. And when you own a house, you're responsible for the things that happen. If your furnace goes out and it's winter, you're gonna probably need a furnace to make sure that you're not freezing in your house. And where is that money going to come from? So I would just be extremely cautious about your plan with looking for the lowest percentage. Um, and I, I hope this isn't coming, like, I hope this is coming across as me caring about uh, your plan with buying a house. I hope this doesn't come across as like me talking down to you. I don't want it to feel that way. I just want, I'm always just very cautious when I hear people who are like, how can I pay the lowest amount of money possible? I think my cat just ate a fly. Okay, she's over there just munching away. <laughs> um, I just want to make sure that you get into a situation that's going to ben benefit you long term and doesn't put you in something that's that's tight or frustrating um, because you bought a house. So I hope it comes across that way. Okay. Do do do. Um, do you have any trustworthy real estate sources in the Maryland DC area? Could you recommend? Um, so I work with Home and Money, uh, who's a ref it's a referral network all throughout the U.S. and they do a fantastic job of. Also, I'm like a third grader; I have to keep readjusting how I sit. Um, they do a really good job at vetting real estate agents. Uh, if you want to work with them, and they can also recommend like several agents if you do want to interview them or talk with them. Um, so there's a link in the description. You can also go to whenthehouseyoulove.com slash agent um, and then just fill out a couple questions and they can connect you with an agent there. And um, usually they'll connect you with a couple and uh, you'll be able to interview them. Um, Veeam Deep. Thanks for doing this. Can you please make a video uh, for different plans available for people on H1B visa to buy a house? Um, I'm not sure if I'll be able to make a video on that entirely. And the only reason I say that is just because like with, with YouTube, it's like you, I can't make a video on every single scenario because those videos don't get views. And then when those videos don't get views, YouTube doesn't push out your other videos. So it's kind of this weird thing of like, if you make the videos too specific, they don't get views on YouTube, which can like hurt your channel long-term. But that's why we do these live streams is because I can answer these questions without them being so deep in the uh, YouTube algorithm. Um, so basically, almost every loan, what they're looking for is that you have work authorization to be in the US. If you have work authorization to be in the US, um, you'll be able to qualify for a mortgage, okay? So as long as that's valid and then you have income as well, um, and then a social, you'll be good to go. Um, it's kind of the, the short uh, answer to that. Uh, Cassandra said that sage advice, uh, no point in going house broke, better to save as much as you can. Yeah, I just, there is no, there's no point I think in, in purchasing a home if it's going to put you in a financial bind. Um, I, I get it. Like I know that renting is really frustrating and can be really limiting. Um, but also what's extremely limiting is a lot of debt and constantly feeling like I can't make these payments and things keep breaking and falling apart that I have to spend money on. And even just moving, like moving can be expensive for a lot of people, especially if you're moving uh, out of state or you're, mo you're moving anywhere that's not locally. Those costs can really add up. 
Drew, he said, y'all used to say Oregon. There's no way. There's no way I used to say Oregon. Oregon. I, if that had to be Dan, there is no, show me the clip. Pull up the receipts. There's no way that I said Oregon. Gone. Oregon. See, I don't even know how to say it. Oregon. I don't believe it. Give me the receipts. <laughs> Antonio arms can become nightmares. Uh, yeah. You know, there's a lot more protections on arms now than there used to be because of those caps. Um, but uh, yeah, it can be, they can be an unfavorable position to be in. Um, doo -doo -doo, let's see, let's see. Drew said arms are great when you don't plan to be in the home long term. Um, I'm, I'm Gad. I'm Gad? Sherry. Sherry. I think. Uh, I want to pay around 50% of a home value in cash. Should I pay all on the down payment or put 20% then do a recast? And is it true only one time recast per mortgage? Um, I haven't heard of only doing a one time recast, but you'll want to check with the specific lender that you're working with. Um, let me pull up. Uh, doo -doo -doo. If you go to winthehouseyoulove.com slash rate hack, I have this handy little chart right here. Um, and you mentioned, how much was it? 50% down versus 20%. So when, when people have quite a bit of a down payment to play around with, uh, usually I would suggest looking at this chart. And what we want to see here is what down payment offers you the, the lowest interest rate possible. And what a lot of people don't realize is there is a chart that uh, all conventional loans use with all different lenders where you can see the down payment and credit score. And I know it's tiny on the screen, but um, just winthehouseyoulove.com slash rate hack, and uh, you'll be able to pull this up. So this is showing you um, the, uh, not the interest rate, but the, I'm trying to think of the best way to explain this. Assume we had a 7% interest rate. If you did 5% down with a 780 score, it'd be 7.125. Versus if you did 25% down, you wouldn't have that extra 1.25% increase. Okay. So basically what we're trying to look at is what's the lowest increase in rate from the down payment and credit score. And did you say your credit score? You didn't. If we just assumed you had a 780, if you're comparing 20% down versus 50% down, you're only going to see a difference in 0.188% of interest rate higher by doing 20% down than 25% down. So what you could do, um, what, I, what I'm gonna suggest for you to do is, uh, let me pull open, um, this is what I call the Loan Clarity Advisor. So this is a software I made to help compare loan situations, loan scenarios. Um, if you use the code Kyle, K-Y-L-E, that's my name, um, you can save 20% uh, off. So let's, let's run, an example here. Let's do conventional at 20% down. And let's assume our interest rate. Actually, let me do in your scenario. Let's do 25% down um, because that's going to give you the most interest rate savings that you're going to see at that higher credit score bracket. Let's assume the rate is 7.5 just for this educational example. If I add in a second loan and let's make it exactly the same, I'm going to do 25 plus 25 is what I'm going to call this. I'm going to call this one first one 25. So let's say this one is also 25% down and same rate. So these are the exact same loan right now. Okay. Let me zoom in so you can see this a little bit better. Hey, that's better. That's way better. So exact same loan, both 25% down 30 years. We're running on a $400,000 purchase price, just as an example, same rate. But if loan two, um, if I compare Let's do uh, a lump sum of an additional 25% on the first payment. Watch what this does. So $100,000. So if we did 100,000 here um, on, oops, that's 10,000. On payment one, I um, actually just realized this is what I want to do. <laughs> this is the comparison I want to do. I want to compare 50% down in your example versus doing 25% down and then the other 25% on payment number one. Now this isn't a recast. This would just be applying it all to the principal. I want to show you how much money this saves you in interest. Uh, if we look at this entire life of the loan, 
you're looking at a hundred, just shy of $200,000 in savings um, of interest. Okay. And that's because you're so aggressively paying down the principal with that extra 25% um, that it sets all your other payments up to apply even more principal a lot quicker. So over five years, you'd be looking at a savings of $7,800. Uh, $7, over 10 years, you're looking at about $40,000 in savings by doing this strategy. Okay. Um, so you have uh, the payment here is higher. So that's something to keep in mind. You could always do a recast, but it won't have the same impact because you're going to be re, re amortizing uh, that loan. So just a strategy to consider um, that could be helpful. Ooh, do, do. Okie dokie. Cassandra, you said my diet's trash. I only have bad suggestions. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. I don't have any trouble eating, getting, you know, getting bad food in my diet. That's not a struggle for me at the moment. Uh, I need, I need good things in my diet. Um, do you think it's a good idea to use a HELOC for a down payment for buying a property with the Burr method? Again, I, I'm probably not the best person to go to for investment strategy advice. Um, you know, it's just not really my my wheelhouse. And I think there are people who are way better um, at that than I am. Uh, if I want to create an, an LLC for an investment home, should I do it before? Um, yes, you're going to need to do it before if you are going to you know plan on purchasing it in the LLC. Um, check with whatever lender you're doing that with. Because some lenders will prefer you do it within a certain time frame, because a lot of lenders want a new unused LLC for buying a home in an investment home. So check with them before you start the LLC, um, just to make sure that they don't have any stipulations with it. Worst case scenario, you just make a new LLC. It doesn't really cost that much money to, to start up an LLC. Uh, is there a certain amount of time that student loans should be in an income-based repayment plan when seeking pre-qualification if seeking to have the actual payment rather than the 0.05% considered? No, as long as we can see documentation about the income-based repayment, um, then we can use that. No problem. Okie dokie. Let's see here. Uh, got that. Drew said, with used homes, you want to ask about things like the type of plumbing that was used. Example, I bought a home and months later had a leak. Uh, found out the type of pipes put in had just settled a lawsuit. Oh, that's nice. Um, that isn't, that's not fun. <laughs> he said, because we're cool people here in Dayton. Uh, yeah, I, I, liked, I like Dayton. Um, Drew, the Burr method is... Uh, <sighs> God, buy, rehab, refinance, repeat. Did I get that right? Buy, rehab, rent, refinance, repeat. Oh, shoot. There's more. There's a there's a fourth R. Wait, one, two, three, four. There's four R's. Um, buy, rehab, refi rent, refinance, repeat uh, is, is that method. Uh, IZB said, I'm confused at what point. Also, I am on the precipice of a sneeze. It's like right there. <laughs> so if it happens at some point, just know that's what's going on. But uh, it's close, but it's not coming. Uh, I'm confused at what point down payment assistance comes into play. I mentioned this to my lender initially, but when I found a house, nothing had been done about DPA. Does it happen after under contract? No, you got to get that squared away beforehand. Um, if you can mention it to your lender, but if the lender doesn't offer any sort of DPA, then it's not going to happen after you're under contract, uh, kind of magically. So you need to ask your lender, Hey, do you have down payment assistance? Any programs like that? Um, and either they're going to say yes and show you what that looks like, or if they don't reply or if they're not telling you, then they don't have down payment assistance and you want to find another lender. So, um, we have a couple DPA programs we have. Um, first of all, there's USDA, which is 0% down. So there is no down payment assistance, but you don't need it because there is no down payment. So that can be a good option, but USDA has an income requirement and a location requirement. Um, we also have a 1% down 
conventional loan. That's really nice. So you also get a 2% grant with that. That's forgivable. That's like the best uh, assistance program I've seen because most DPA programs are going to have a much higher interest rate. Um, you're paying, you know, basically you're paying it in a way through the higher interest rate. And sometimes there's recapture as well, meaning you might have to be in the home um, for a certain amount of years for that money to not have to be paid back. Uh, so the 1% down conventional loan is really good. Um, we do also have two FHA d uh, down payment assistance programs. Um, one is three and a half percent grant and the other is a 5% grant. So um, those are all options that you can take a look at. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Uh, when making an offer with contingency to sell my home first, does that put me in a weak offering position? Um, it does. It does put you in a weak offering position. And basically what a contingency is for those people who don't know is it's, is saying, um, you know, uh, I'm God, I believe is how you say your name. Uh, so like an I'm God situation, uh, they have a home and it's basically saying we want to buy this home from you. Um, but if our home doesn't sell, we won't be able to move forward with your purchase. So for a seller, they're saying, great, someone wants to buy my house, but it's contingent on their house selling. And if that home doesn't sell, then our home sale falls through. And so it does put you in a weaker offering position. In some markets, that's not an issue. Um, you know, It really just depends on your local market and how competitive it is. So if you are in a competitive market, then I would start to see, is there another way that you can make your offer more interesting to the seller? And sometimes that can come in terms of a price or maybe you um, are more lenient on your inspection requirements. Um, you know, talk with your real estate agent about ways that you can make your offer stronger to compensate for that. Um, and then also just consider like in a, uh, in a market that's not super competitive, you may not have to like add any sort of like compensation to that contingency. It's just kind of something to, to think about. Janet, hello. Hello from Los Angeles. Janet, what's the Los Angeles real estate market like out there? Is it is it crazy? Um Let's see what else we got going on. IDR payments that lost at least 12 months for these payments. It's 12 months is limit for having a reply. Um it's crazy expensive. Yeah, I believe that about uh, LA. Uh, can we negotiate a price on a newly built home? Um, yeah, I mean, you're welcome to to do that if you'd like. Uh, most builders probably aren't really going to negotiate. Um, usually they kind of have a little bit of an upper hand on that. Uh, and if they do reduce prices, that's usually something they kind of do across the board. But I mean, you're welcome to, to, to give it a shot. There's no rule against it. Um, Penny Mac five, one arm. Uh, yeah. Penny Mac did have a five, one arm. I think that might've been when I was talking about the arms that was crazy low. It was like, a FHA was like, I want to remember it's like six per like 6.5% introductory rate on that five, one arm. And then it was like a week or so ago. Uh, they took it away. <laughs> Thoughts on rate outlook in the next five years. Oh my, I don't know, man. I, Nobody knows what's happening next week, let alone in the next five years. Uh, I, I can't give an answer on that. Um, Noah, he said, uh, your channel's helped a lot with buying my first home with my wife. Uh, we now have a child now and we're working on the second. Cool. Uh, any starts for buying a second home? Um, it depends on, are you buying a set, like a secondary home, like a home, like a vacation home? Or is this going to be a new home that you're going to live in? Um, if you can clarify that, I'll circle back to your question here. Um, BMST Group Inc. My mom is five years in on her uh, in on her current home, which is FHA. She is now in talk now to buy another home from the seller, which is a two family here in New York. What's the best foot forward? Um, she's five years in her home at FHA. She's now in talk to buy a two family. Um, is the two family, is she going to be purchasing that as like a primary residence that she's going to live in? 
Um, if so, then that's pretty straightforward. And she's, I'm assuming she's maybe selling her current home. Um, you know, then I would ask, does she have the down payment to be able to purchase uh, this two family? Um, or is this second family home gonna be an investment that kind of changes everything um, pretty drastically? Uh, yo fam said, what is the site used at the beginning of your broadcast for the monthly payment interest rate, etc.?" Um, if you're talking about this, if you're talking about this, um, this is uh, a software I made uh, it's called the loan clarity advisor. So you can go to win the house you love.com click right up here, tools right here. Um, so I do have it for sale. It's uh, if you use the code Kyle, you can get 20% off K Y L E like 17 bucks so you know it's it's not super expensive um the other tools where'd the comment go <laughs> uh other tools that do that um will actually charge you a hundred dollars per month like the only other software that does what the cal my calculator does those there's two other ones that do it um and they cost a hundred dollars per month <laughs> so I feel like a $17 one-time payment is pretty cheap um, to have the same exact calculations in there. And it's not just an amortization calculator that you can find anywhere online. Um, it actually is comparing these loans with the net cost of the loans and showing the details through them. Um, and a lot of the online calculators are wrong. I, it's amazing. I bet the FHA one, FHA calculator, there's like FHA calculator dot org or something uh where where was it fha calculator man fha calculator.com or something there was one of these that the whole website was about this and it was completely wrong um same thing one of the other softwares that charges like a hundred dollars a month they had been doing the calculations wrong on their loans for years and i messaged them and was like because i was building my own and i was comparing it against theirs to make sure everything is accurate and i the numbers would not add up and then i messaged them finally i was like you guys your your math is wrong here and they're like no no it's not like yeah i sent them the guidelines <laughs> they they even contacted fha themselves and uh they're like hey you were right we've no one's found this error in like 20 years <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of wild. Um, Cassandra, you said chickens have sassy personalities because they're, they're food <laughs> and they need defense mechanism. You know, you're right. I hadn't considered that that's, they do live in that fear, don't they? You're right. Um... Rodolfo, how do you see the Austin market? Um, you know, I'm not super familiar with uh, independent markets, but um, I do like this tool, uh, Altos Research. Um, it's just altosresearch.com. And then if you go to market reports right here and then run a report, let me pull this off screen just so it doesn't auto put my address in here. Really quick and I'll pull it back. Okay, well, it's pulling up a different zip code, but um, you can put in your zip code here and they run a market data report um, that has a lot of really interesting stuff in here. And really quickly up top, they show you whether it's in a seller's market or buyer's market. Um, let me see if I can do Austin really quickly. What's an Austin zip code? Oh man, there's so many. Um, this might not be the exact one that you want, but. Let me try. Rodolfo, can you can you let me know a zip code um, in Austin that you want to run? And I will put it in here. There's when I pulled up Austin zip codes, there were like at least 20. So I don't know what the right one that you want to use. And Drew said Austin market don't. So uh, that's <laughs> there's another data point there for you. Uh. Tillamook is a cheese from Oregon. Tillamook is a cheese, a great cheese from Oregon, is what I'm learning. Interesting. What kind of cheese is it? 
I don't, I don't know anything. I've never heard that before. On an FHA 203K, can we rehab the place ourselves or do we need general contractors? Um, how are rehab funds dispersed? Uh, yeah, you do need a general contractor and usually those are gonna be dispersed uh, um, in phases to the contractor as work is done. So um, the main reason why they have to do that is because there have been periods of time in which um, people have just taken all the money <laughs> and then they don't actually do the work that needs to be done or they don't do the work that they said they were going to do that would actually um, increase the value of the home. So yeah, you do need to have a general contractor and often you also need a two or three K consultant who oversees that process. Drew said cheddar, sharp, mild Colby Jack. Come on, man. It's a great brand. Oh, it can tell a muck is a brand, not a type. I need to look this up. This is the riveting content you all wanted, right? Me looking up cheese types. Let's see. What do we got here? Tillamook Farmer. Oh, it's a brand. All right. They have ice cream too. Tillamook. They got a, a ship. Hmm. I mean, is this is this something I should be onto? Should I be? Should I care about cheese like this? I mean, there's a, there's a lot of, there's cheese curds coming soon, Drew. I don't know if you need to be on that, but uh, I guess I'm going to start pitching this, this cheese, the cheese man. I don't, I don't know, man. I guess I need to be up on the world of cheese brands. Oh, do, 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 do. Drew, you said Canada has hu huge issues for a year that if they didn't use agents with commissions and buyers agents would show the house. Matt, wait, has huge issues for a year if, that if they didn't use agents with commissions and the buyer's agent wouldn't, sh oh, wouldn't show the house. Wow. Uh, that's wild. That's gotta be a, some legal issue there. You know what's interesting too about Canada? Um, I, Canada's housing market is worse off than ours is. And it does kind of terrify me a bit to see, um, you know, I, I think a lot of people have kind of done the thing with housing prices recently in the U S where they're like, there's no way it can go up because it, there's just no way it can keep going up. But then if we look to Canada and see what their housing prices have been like, they're in an even worse affordability problem than the U S is. And you know, it's not a good excuse to say like home prices can't go up just because I don't think they will, they should be able to go up any higher. It's not a good <laughs> logical argument for saying why, um, home prices can't go up. So I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of feeling like it's interesting to take a look at what's happening in Canada's housing market to see like things could get even worse in the U S I don't know that to be true, but it's a, there's another like data source right there of what could happen to home prices as well. Uh, you said Canada a couple of years ago said no non-Canadian citizen can purchase a home until like 2025. Yeah, I did hear about that uh, recently as well. Um, Libri, are current contracts okay or need to swap to buyer paying for their agent? Um, at the moment, I don't know of any action that's taken on this ruling. Um, and I, it's not that the buyer's paying for the agent is, it's not like it's illegal. There's no ruling that's like buyers, or I'm sorry, the seller can't pay for the buyer's agent. What the ruling was, was saying that, um, basically all of these companies schemed, or they used the word conspiracy, um, what, how would you say that did a conspiracy started a conspiracy conspired? <laughs> That's it. They <laughs> took me a second to figure it out. They conspired. Uh, so if you want to learn how to use that word, it's now they conspired. Um, basically what they're saying in the ruling is that they conspired to fix prices at fix, uh, a seller paying 6%, five to 6%. That's what they're saying 
was illegal and that's what the settlement is about it's not saying that it's illegal for sellers to pay the buyer's agent so that's likely going to be fine for everybody who's in contract now what it opens the question is what does that then mean um because if like our seller like what does it mean for sellers are they going to stop paying for buyer's agents All right and if and if so um what, what did you Oh, you, oh, I see what you're saying. Drew, you probably told me the Canada information. That's probably where I heard it. Um, so as far as what does it mean? What's the implication of that? Uh, I don't know yet. It, this ruling was only yesterday. So, you know, are sellers going to start saying, I'm not going to be paying for a buyer's agent? Um, and, and the implications of that can be quite a few different things. You might see, uh, you know, then it might be more difficult for people to purchase a home if they're working with a real estate agent because... The real estate agent's probably going to want to get paid. So either they're like, are they going to reduce uh, their commission so that the buyer is able to pay it? Or is the, are they going to try and negotiate for the seller to pay a portion? Um, I don't, it's going to be really interesting to see how that shakes out. And I, I just don't know. I don't know the answers to that. Um, the market's going to do what the market wants to do. And I think a lot of people are probably going to be frustrated by what the market decides to do. <laughs> um, Drew said the seller agent is going to want, still want that 6%. Well, I mean, the seller's agent would have only got 3%, right? The seller's agent, you know, it's a, a total of 6%. So 3% goes to the seller's agent. 3% goes to, goes to the buyer's agent. So, uh, you know, I, I guess that's on the table too, is, you know, the sellers wanting to negotiate down from uh, 3% to the seller's agent. Very possible. Um, in higher priced markets, um, it's not uncommon for the seller to pay 2% to each agent, um, you know, bring into that to around, around, uh, 4% as opposed to six. Um, I know one, one agent and I know there's others like this. Um, the guy's a, a big jerk, but, uh, his whole thing is he's like, I only list homes. He's like, I'm a seller's agent. That's all I do. And I only sell expensive homes. And I charge 4% because I'm good. And like, okay, cool. <laughs> um, and people buy it. They're like, yeah, I'm going to pay this person 4% instead of 3% um, because he's good. And I don't know. That's just, I, I, I don't know that I quite believe. How do I say this without making people mad? I don't think listing agents have a ton of power to market a home for a certain price. I know a lot of real estate agents kind of do this thing of like, I'll sell your home for the best, the highest dollar. And really like selling your home for the highest dollar doesn't come down to one person selling the home and peddling your home. It comes down to um, primarily like what, what's the comparables to your home? What is your home's value? Like what, what's the actual statistical value of your home based on comparables? And there's a few other things that you can do in negotiation to um, make that home more attractive or guide people through the process. And I think guiding people through the process is really valuable. And what agents do is really valuable in that aspect. But I don't think there's some magic thing that real estate agents have that all of a sudden can make a home value increase. That would be crazy if we lived in a world like that, where some salesman who wrote, you know, read the 50 rules of power or whatever that thing's called <laughs> all of a sudden can increase home values by 10%. Like that's not, that's not how that works. Um, I don't know. It's my soapbox. Cena, do you have a calculator that shows projected equity? I 100% do. Um, the loan clarity advisor, which is my loan comparison calculator in the description. If you use the code Kyle, it's 20% uh, off. Um, it does show equity. So let me add in, do, 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 do. down in this section it shows equity so it shows your equity in the home with different loan types um also i have this little selling and appreciation section that i think is really cool basically what it shows you is like if you're gonna let's say in 10 years look at the appreciation versus the cost of selling um you can put in the home appreciation rate expectation the cost to sell um tax increase per year and insurance increase per year and it will show you how much the net cost is of owning this home. And you can see over time at which you get positive growth. So you can see it's not until year 19 with these loans 
that you actually get positive appreciation where the home actually doesn't cost you money. And this, I think, is where a lot of people kind of get confused about homeownership being an investment. Because, like, let's take a look at 10 years, right? In this, in these very simple examples, let's take a look at, um, let me do a more realistic interest rate. Let's do like 8%. So let's just do one loan to make it easier. Let's say a conventional loan with 3% down. If you were looking at selling at 10 years, your home value, if it appreciated at 4% per year over 10 years, you're gonna be looking at you know an increase of about $40,000 in appreciation, but you didn't make $40,000, right? Just because you bought it at 40 or 400,000 and then sold it for 440. You didn't make the $40,000. You still had, you know, a the cost of that loan as well. Um, and, oh, I'm sorry, I said that wrong. That was the conventional loan cost. Uh, right, you gained appreciation over this period of time, but you also had to pay to sell it. You also have the loan cost, right? And all interest, mortgage insurance, and I have that listed all right here, right? You know, $294,000 in interest, $22,000 in mortgage insurance, right? So you paid all of that money to get a home that appreciated. That with property taxes and homeowners insurance, it costs you around two hundred fifty thousand dollars to live in this home over that period of time. So, buying a house usually, a, you know, a primary residence isn't so much like good as an investment vehicle on its own. What your savings comes from is that you aren't paying rent because if we look at comparable rent, right, like a rental payment of twenty three hundred dollars per month, which was comparable to well, even cheaper uh, than what we would be paying on the mortgage. With annual rent increase of 3%, it would cost $320,000 over 10 years for renting. So that's where buying a home isn't that you're gonna make tons of money with your primary residence. For most people, that's not true. Um, it's mainly that you're not putting all that money into rent and you have it's cheaper in that sense. So it was you know, $70,000 cheaper, the difference between these two numbers. $70,000 cheaper in this scenario to purchase a home than it was to rent. And so that's where you see the monetary benefit of owning a home is, is in that savings, not in because the home, you know, magically increased in value and then all of a sudden you got the check from it. Um, oh, I forgot to show you one other thing in here. The, I also have this section that shows like an estimated check at closing because th these are the the raw numbers that you won't see in real life. The real life numbers are that you paid principal into the home, you built the equity in the home, and you get that money back, the money that you paid into the principal at the time of closing. So at the end of 10 years, you know, you have your future value of the home, the loan balance remaining, and the cost to sell. So the check you would get back at closing would be $216,000. So that's where a lot of people I think can be led astray about owning a home because you know in this situation someone might have sold their home in 10 years and got a check for this much money and been like this is the best investment i've ever made <laughs> you should be buying homes and then you know selling a course here's why here's how i made six figures selling my house like all of that kind of stuff when in reality most of this money was principal that you paid into the mortgage along with the appreciation but from a net cost perspective, you still paid property taxes, right? What this isn't factoring is, you know, you, you made $216,000, great. But over 10 years, you paid about $70,000 in property taxes. You paid about $20,000 in homeowner's insurance. You probably also had maintenance costs that you paid. Um, and then also a lot of this money was money that was um, principal that you paid into the mortgage that you've been paying every single month to build equity. So, all right, I should probably be done with my math rant at some point, um, because maybe that's not as fun. Yeah, it starts 48 laws of power. I think I was just kind of being a little facetious by saying 50 laws of power. Um, uh, was I a math major? No, I was a finance major. I do love calculators. Um, you know, it is a big, I think for, like starting in the mortgage world in the beginning, I was always so confused. Like, I feel like everyone was making decisions about these really important things based off of anecdotes. 
Like the amount of people who would just be like, yeah, FHA is more expensive than conventional. And then everybody starts to say that, but no one's actually showing the numbers. And then when you look at the numbers, there's a lot of times where FHA is cheaper than conventional. And so I started to kind of like get down this rabbit hole of like, man, everyone's making these decisions, not based on real life numbers because it's was too difficult to compare these numbers side by side. So that's why I've been so intense <laughs> about wanting to make ways that it's easier for people to access this information and get real life information about the decisions that they're making. Because sometimes these decisions between like loan types or what you're gonna do with down payment money or how you're gonna structure the loan so you have a better interest rate can save you tens of thousands of dollars. And it's just wild to me that we're leaving all these decisions up to like a gut feeling rather than actually putting it in and seeing like, I can see a real number answer. Like loan B saves me $10,000. So I'm gonna choose that just by making the right decision. Um, so that's why I feel like I'm a little neurotic about calculators. Um, what's the best commercial loan for a homeowner looking to do a rental property? Um, you could do a DSCR loan, which is a debt service coverage ratio loan, where basically they just look at the income, uh, rental income from the property, as opposed uh, compared to the mortgage payment, rather than looking at your personal income. That's probably gonna be your, your best bet there. They do have a higher interest rate though and a higher down payment. Um, Cassandra, are you still gonna release the home buying planner? Um, no, I kind of put that on the back burner for a while because like, I don't know. I don't know how valuable that would be. Um, I don't know. I think if maybe more people were interested in it, um, at the moment, I've just been kind of focused on making like smaller, more like numbers based things to help people make some of these decisions rather than like a whole planner. But it may be something that I consider in the future. Uh, any strategies for buying a secondary home without comprising the first home's 2.9% interest rate? We would rent house one to a family and live in house two. Um, as long as you have lived in your first home uh, for at least a year, you can rent it out without having to refinance. Um, so you are good to go there. Oh, goodness. I can get to the point of talk. Let's see. What have we been doing this for? About an hour? It's like just at about an hour is where I need to build up that. Uh, <laughs> I was about to say throat stamina, but maybe I shouldn't. Maybe that's not what I want to go with. I need to build up some like. Uh, how do people talk for just hours on end? I don't know. It's about this point in time where there's something in my throat that's like. I need to slow down. Uh, is there a new Fannie Mae loan guideline starting November 18th? Um, if anything, it would be loan limits are usually usually come around come out around that point in time. Um, I'm assuming that's what you're talking about is loan limit increases every mid-ish November. Um, we get new loan limits that track or follow along with uh, the home price index. <laughs> Cassandra, we don't have to bring it up. We don't have to say anything about that, okay? We don't need to. We don't need to talk about the stamina there. Um, I'm drinking a diet caffeine-free Pepsi, and this is now a sponsored ad. You should purchase. Actually, don't do it. I don't care. Um, I I gotta say, I I love I love some diet drinks when that sweet chemical hits hits my mouth it really just does something for me um i don't know i don't know what it is about them yeah it costs 35 bucks to set up an lc you don't even have to live there uh doo -doo -doo. 
There's a lot of people asking about the burr method. Is that um the the only thing I'm it what's weird to me about the burr method is like not that it can be a legitimate strategy, but I feel like most of what I see about it. Oh man, that sneeze is about to come back. You know what it's just right there? It's like it so wants to be there, but it's not happening. And there's nothing I can do to like to get it to either go away or yeah. Um the only problem with like the burr method stuff is that I see a lot of like finance bros making courses and stuff on it. And it's just I don't know. Kind of gives me the ick <laughs> to see <laughs> to see all that stuff. Um look up looking up what is that going to help me sneeze or not sneeze cuz i love i do love sneezing it's uh sneezing really just really works for me <laughs> um aretha johnson you said could you explain the 3 1 buy down um i think you mean the 3 2 1 buy down so let me explain the 2 1 buy down first and then i'll explain the 3 1 so if you go to winthouseyoulove.com right here here's our website uh you can also get pre qualified with us right so there's a couple options. You can get pre-qualified. You can do a refinance. Um, you can also just ask us a question and we'll reply with a video. Um, so if you go to tools, two, one buy down calculator, basically what uh, these buy downs are, they're temporary buy downs. A permanent buy down is where you pay money up front. Think of it like, think of it like prepaid interest. You pay money up front and it lowers your interest rate. Um, a permanent buy down lowers it for the entire duration of the mortgage. So 30 years, for instance, a temporary buy down is where we only buy down, um, the first two years, sometimes the first three years of the mortgage. Um, and most of the time this is paid for by the seller or the builder. So for instance, if we go through an example, let's say we're looking at a $450,000 purchase. Do I need to make this bigger? That should be good. Um, let's say a $450,000 purchase with 5% down. And let's say the interest rate is, I don't know, 8% is what it would be on the loan. So a 2-1 buy down, the way this works is in year one, the interest rate is lowered by 2%. In year two, the interest rate is lowered by 1%. And then in year three, it's the normal rate of the loan, right? So 2% reduction, 1% reduction. That's why it's a 2-1 buy down. A three, two, one buy down is we just add one more year to it. So year one, it's reduced by 3%. Year two, it's reduced by 2%. Year three, it's reduced by 1%. And year four, it's the normal rate of the loan. So you can see that here, you know, the note rate of the loan would be 8% in this example. So year three is where we have an 8% rate and $3,100 per month payment. But in year one, our payment's only $2,563 because our interest rate is 6%. So we saved $574 per month. In year two, our rate bumps up from 6% to 7%. And now we only have $293 per month in savings. So our payment's 288, I'm sorry, 2,844. And then in year three, it goes up to $3,137 per month. And uh, so again, you can get this calculator on my website if you want, but you can see how much credit would need to come from the seller or the builder. So you would have to negotiate for the seller or builder to pay about $10,000. And that gets put into an escrow account. And that's what funds uh, that lower payment. Um, so that would be 2.3.2.31% um, of the purchase price. So it explains a little bit more uh, in this calculator and I have a whole video on it here. But um, three, two, one is not super common. Two, one is much more common. Just because um, three, two, one uh, buy downs are re require more money, um, and so they're not as as common um, to get those funded as much as a two, one buy down is. Nervous Abbott, hello. You said me, please, and you put a little wave. Uh, oh, okay, I see your question. Let me. Um, I'll I'll get down to that. Here, it might just take me a second. Michael, uh, hello, Kyle. Thanks for doing the videos and lives. For first time buyers putting 5% down, what percent of the house price would you say is acceptable to have set aside to be in a better position? 
Um, I don't think you need a percentage of the home price. I think having uh, months of emergency fund is more helpful. So I think three months is a really good spot to be in if you're looking to purchase a house. So what that includes is take what your monthly living expenses would be, like everything to maintain your quality of life. Um, maybe that's not fair for an emergency fund, but everything to maintain your life, right? You have to pay your future mortgage. You have to pay, maybe you have a car. Um, you have to pay for gas and groceries and insurance and savings and childcare if you have that. All of that, how much would that cost you per month? Let's say it's $3,000 per month. Um, some people like to have that to be inflated to match their lifestyle. Some people go, what's their bare bones budget? Um, so no, maybe you're, you know, you're taking out eating out expenses and things like that. But let's say it was $3,000 per month for you to live. Um, multiply that number times three, and that would give you a three month emergency fund. So $9,000. So I think having an emergency fund like that is probably more effective than just a percentage of the home price. Because an emergency fund, the theory is basically, if all of your income got shut off today, you theoretically have three months of, okay, I can live for three months without anything being affected. Month four is where all of a sudden we're gonna run into some issues. So that basically gives you three months to find an additional source of income, um, which it depends on your risk level for a lot of people works perfectly fine because a lot of people don't like don't have any emergency funds set aside um so from there it depends on your risk level and there are a lot of people who want a six-month emergency fund if they're self-employed or on commission income um, it really kind of just depends uh do 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 Brandon, you said if you buy a house today at 8% and only put 5% down, then home prices go down 20% the next three years, but rates are 3%, are you unable to refinance because not enough equity? Um, yes, you would be unable to refinance on a conventional loan without paying money. So you'd have to make up the difference um, to be able to pay down your loan to get down to the equity required for the refinance. Um, if you had uh, like a streamlined FHA loan, you might think about this. You likely would be able to lower the rate without having to get a new appraisal um, in some circumstances on a streamlined FHA refinance. Uh, this is a good question. Tacnito, is it more cost effective to buy points than do a refinance later? It's such a hard question to answer because it really depends on like what could rates drop down to. Um, you know, obviously, if they drop significantly, then you're gonna. It might make a lot more sense than if they drop moderately. So it's hard to figure that out exactly. All that to say, like a refinance is gonna cost on average a thousand to two thousand dollars. So. You know, it, a refinance doesn't cost that much money com compared to like the cost of points. Um, and I see, I mean, I'm seeing people who are paying so much money in points that I don't think they should be doing. Um, all because they think a refinance is going to cost them so much money. It just doesn't. So it really is what, what you're comfortable with. But a refinance just does not cost that much money. Um, not enough for, I think, it to be worth it to be paying thousands and thousands of dollars in uh in discount points. All right, everybody. I think it's about time to wrap this up. Been doing this about an hour and a half. Um, so I do want to show you another way that we just came up with to answer questions. So um, if you go to winthehouseyoulove.com, um, there's a couple ways, you know, because I, I didn't wasn't able to answer everybody's question um, today. And what you can do is you can get pre-qualified. So if you want to talk with a member of our team, um, we work in all 50 states. We work with all different types of loan programs, all the ones you've heard about, conventional, FHA, down payment assistance, the whole deal. You can schedule a call to get pre-qualified. Or if you just have a question, um, just click, I have a question. And what you can do is type in your question here, and then it comes to us on the back end, and either 
uh, myself or our team lead, Dan Frio, um, will actually reply to your question with a video. So we sit in front of a camera, we press record, and then we'll answer your question with a video. Um, it can take us like up to a, a day or two to answer those questions just because we do get quite a few of them and we like to spend time answering them. So you're welcome to do that if I wasn't able to answer your question here. Um, but I'll also be streaming uh, next week, um, same, you know, Wednesday, same time, same place, and uh, would love to be able to help you out then. Okay, so if you do want to get pre-qualified, you can go to winthehouseyoulove.com. Um, there's also other resources uh, down below uh, for the diff you know calculators or connecting with an agent. Um, so thank you all for being here. I really appreciate it. And um, maybe I'll sneeze after this at some point. <laughs> have a great rest of your weekend or rest of your week. It's not the weekend yet. Uh, have a great rest of your week. And uh, I'll talk with you all next week.